Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this webinar about the Generator Improvements Rule Package. My name is Jackie Keller Potvin, and I have been with the agency approximately three years. I actually was hired a month after this rule went final at the federal level. It is posted at the federal level in the Federal Register dated November 28, 2016. As we're talking about this rule as written in the federal language, just a brief overview of the Ohio rulemaking process and where all of these concepts are in that process. The generator improvement rule has already been out to the ESO, which is the early stakeholder outreach. The rule package is then drafted directly into Ohio rule language. This rule language will be released in the next um, approximate 30 days for the interested party or IP phase of the rule package. If you would like to be notified when this rule package is ready for interested party review, please go to the Ohio EPA website, click register for updates, and as you sign up for updates, you would want to be signing up for hazardous waste rule updates. You would then get an auto-generated email stating when the draft rules are released, and they will be posted on the website under the Division of Environmental Response and Revitalization or also known as DER. And since our division is putting out the rules um, under our rules tab is where you would be able to view the draft rule language. As I said, look for that in the next 30 days to be released for public comment. A brief overview of what we are going to cover today. The generator improvement rule package had a large amount of reorganization of the generator rules meaning that where you used to be able to locate rule language has now been moved into different locations and even they have broken rules that used to be extremely long to read into separate new rule numbers. There are also optional provisions that are included in this rule package and by optional this means that it is typically added flexibility and less stringent meaning Ohio EPA has the option of picking this up into their state language. All of the provisions as written at the federal level are currently being drafted into the Ohio language, so you will be able to see this draft optional rule language. There are provisions that are considered less stringent, again, adding flexibility, and you'll see a big overlap between the optional provisions and the less stringent provisions. Finally, we will go into our more stringent provisions that are adding some environmental protection. These are provisions from the federal level that Ohio must pick up into state language to maintain an equivalent program to US EPA. First, we will start with the reorganization. The purpose of the reorganization is to ease the understanding for regulated facilities by doing this, it has added different definitions into the definition of hazardous waste rule. In this rule, you will see new terms that have previously not been defined, like the generator categories. There are also the added rule numbers and regulations that previously have not existed. This would include a regulation about generator category determination, the very small quantity generator regulation, um, a new rule number dedicated to satellite accumulation area, also a small and large quantity generation regulate, regulation added for each generator category. Part of the optional modifications start with the housekeeping. By housekeeping, there is some changing in the name of what used to be a conditionally exempt small quantity generator is now referred to as a very small quantity generator or VSQG for the remaining slides. The reorganization of the regulations as we previously talked about are also a housekeeping item just to ease the readability. The optional modification is also adding the definitions clearly stated for central accumulation area or CAA, the generator category definitions. Also, defining an independent requirement versus a condition for exemption. As far as optional provisions, 
There is the provision for a large quantity generator being able to consolidate waste from very small quantity generators. Another optional provision of episodic generator and the final optional provision of a large quantity generator being able to obtain a waiver from the 50-foot rule. First, we will start with the optional provision independent requirement versus condition for exemption. An independent requirement is a regulatory requirement that is not tied to accumulating hazardous waste. Examples of this concept are determining the generator category, using a manifest to ship the waste, and record-keeping requirements. The next definition that is introduced is a condition for exemption. This is a regulatory requirement that must be met by the generator to be exempt from obtaining a storage permit. Some examples of a condition for exemption are container and tank standards, personnel training, and emergency preparedness and prevention requirements. The next less stringent provision is a large quantity generator being able to consolidate waste received from a very small quantity generator. This would allow a very small quantity generator to send waste off-site to a large quantity generator without having the use of a manifest. Both of the facilities must be under the control of the same person. Both control and person are defined terms on the slide, there are some examples, and also in the regulations, these are defined terms to make sure that your facility can qualify for this optional provision. Again, the receiver of the off-site shipment must be a large quantity generator. A small quantity generator or very small quantity generator could not receive waste from a very small quantity generator. Likewise, the shipper of the waste must be a very small quantity generator. A small quantity generator or a large quantity generator would not be able to ship their waste off-site to another large quantity generator. This does apply to hazardous waste shipments. For universal waste shipments, please refer to the universal waste chapter um, for how to handle those types of waste sh shipments. For the very small quantity generator, if you determine that you have two sites able to take advantage of this provision, the very small quantity generator facility would need to mark all of the containers with the words hazardous waste. They would also need to mark the containers with an indication of the hazards of the contents of those containers. There are different examples listed of ways to comply with the indication of the hazards. There is no set limit on the amount or type of waste that the very small quantity generator could send to a large quantity generator when participating in this provision. The large quantity generator has more requirements than the very small quantity generator. The large quantity generator would need to notify Ohio EPA more than 30 days prior to receiving the first shipment. This includes if you are adding an additional very small quantity generator to your list. The 30-day prior applies to every time you are adding very small quantity generator facilities. The records of all waste received must be maintained on file for three years. For dating the waste received, it would be the date the waste arrived at the large quantity generator from the very small quantity generator facility. All of the waste received from the very small quantity generator must be managed under large quantity generator regulations. This includes the biennial report. The biennial report is a report of all shipments and received waste at the large quantity generator during the odd numbered years. For example, 2019 is currently a reporting year, as 2021 will be a report year. All of the waste must be reported 
on the biennial report due either March 1, 2020 for 2019 or March 1, 2022 for the 2021 reporting year. To be able to differentiate the waste received by the large quantity generator from the very small quantity generator, a new source code has been added to the biennial report that is G51. The benefits of participating in this program is that no manifest is needed to ship the waste to the large quantity generator, meaning this would not be tracked in the e-manifest system, and if a paper manifest is used, this would not need to be sent into US EPA. No manifesting is even needed. However, this waste does remain subject to DOT requirements. If you have facilities across state lines from each other, interstate shipments are allowed, but please ensure that both states have adopted this provision for the large quantity generator and the very small quantity generators to be able to participate in this program. This is from the federal notification form of an addendum when I stated that the large quantity generator must notify Ohio EPA. It will be very similar to this form. What you see is a space for different very small quantity generator facilities. If you happen to have more than one that would be able to participate, please list the EPA ID number if it's already been assigned, the name, address, and contact information for the facility that will be sending waste to the large quantity generator. Again, this notification requirement is a responsibility of the large quantity generator receiving the off-site shipment and it needs to be received greater than 30 days prior to receiving the first shipment. The next provision we'll move into is episodic generation. This provision allows an SQG or VSQG to maintain their existing generator category in the event of a planned or even unplanned episodic generation. These events must be no longer than 60 days. If the 60 day is uh, exceeded, this event would not qualify as episodic generation. Each facility is guaranteed one event per year that they can notify Ohio EPA of. The petition for a second event does have additional qualifications. The first qualification would be that it would need to be an opposite type of event than the first event. As the example states, if you had a planned tank cleanout and had already notified Ohio EPA using your first episodic event, your second event would have to be something unplanned, for example, a spill type activity in which you would still have to notify Ohio EPA to take advantage of the petition for the second event. On the previous slide, we talked about notifying Ohio EPA. This would be done by using Ohio EPA Form 9029. Also could use the online application of My RICRA ID. For the planned episodic event, notice 30 days prior to initiating the planned event is your required time frame. If the event is unplanned within 72 hours, the initial notification can be done via phone or email, but then follow up with the EPA 9029 or use the MyRICRA ID application. The event, as stated, must be completed within 60 days. This includes shipping all of this episodic waste that was generated off-site. There is an addendum to the notification form to participate in episodic generator. This is, again, the federal form as Ohio, since the regulations are not in place, has not created an equivalent to this addendum. The information, however, will, will remain the same. As you can see, examples of planned events could be a lab clean out, um, clean out from um, inventory excess, a short-term maintenance event, uh, there also is space for an other where you can explain what is going on at the facility. For unplanned events, the acts of nature, 
damaged equipment, product recall, spill, and again, space to fill in for other if you believe your facility has ex experienced an unplanned event that does not fit the above examples. The emergency contact must be noted. Again, the beginning date and end date within 60 days of each other and different places for you to describe the different waste streams coming from the event. For a VSQG who experiences an episodic event and would like to take advantage of this provision, the VSQG must obtain an EPA ID number if they don't already have one. The waste must be transported using a hazardous waste manifest, a hazardous waste transporter, and be sent to a RICRA designated facility. The VSQG must minimize the possibility of an accident or release to the environment all episodic waste containers must be labeled. For the event, there needs to be an emergency coordinator available. And all records of the episodic waste must be maintained on file for three years. For an SQG wishing to take advantage of episodic generation, they would simply comply with the existing SQG regulations and also keep the record keeping of the episodic event on file for three years. The benefit of these, this provision would be the SQG or VSQG would not be required to submit a biennial report as when these facilities are taking advantage of episodic generation, the, they are no longer classified as being a LQG and by no longer being the LQG during a report year would not fall into the requirements of biennial report. The next less stringent provision would be the waiver from a 50-foot rule. As stated, this rule is difficult for some facilities to comply with if they are less than 100 feet wide. The waiver would allow a large quantity generator to approach the fire marshal to obtain a waiver from the 50-foot rule. The fire marshal will evaluate the precautions taken to make sure it is appropriate and safe. We will now transition into the more stringent provisions, the first of which being a small quantity generator is now required to re-notify. A small quantity generator was able historically to obtain an EPA ID number and was never required to update the information associated with that EPA ID number. Beginning in year 2021, small quantity generators will have to re-notify to Ohio EPA prior to September 1st. This re-notification can be done using EPA Form 9029 or the online MyRICR ID application. The re-notification process will be every four years after 2021, still keeping that September 1st deadline. Large quantity generators will also have a re-notification aspect. Since the large quantity generators are already submitting the biennial report every other year, the re-notification will be March 1st of even numbered years as part of the biennial report. Again, the use of EPA Form 9029, which is already part of the BR, is a perfect way to comply with this new re-notification. The next more stringent provision is container labeling. All containers would need to be labeled with the words hazardous waste, also indicate the waste hazards possessed by the waste. There are different examples listed um, that are actually suggested by US EPA in ways to comply with this new provision. The waste must also have the accumulation start date and before shipping the waste off site, waste codes must be applied. This can also be complied with using a barcode mechanism where the waste codes are associated directly with that barcode. For tank labeling requirements, the waste accumulation start date or using your inventory log to track the waste generation. Also, labeling the tanks with the words hazardous waste and again, an indication of the waste hazards 
and feel free to refer back to the examples from the container labeling. For a satellite accumulation area, the words hazardous waste must be labeled. Again, the indication of the waste hazards with examples provided, adding also the date in which the volume exceeds 55 gallons. Once this occurs, move the waste to a central accumulation area, or CAA, within three days, or ship off-site. The next, more stringent provision is emergency planning and preparedness. The LQG requirements have actually moved in the federal program to subpart M, listed above for reference if you would like to view the federal rules while waiting for the Ohio rules to be released. The contingency plan and emergency planning applies only to the areas where hazardous waste is generated, treated, or accumulated. The federal uh, rule has removed the requirement for personal information to be contained in the contingency plan. It also has added a flexible location area for all emergency equipment. The concept of a contingency plan quick reference guide has been added. To dig in deeper about the quick reference guide, this type of document would contain the types, amount, and location of the hazardous waste, the hazards posed by the hazardous waste, identify the hazardous waste, the exposure risk that might require special emergency treatment, maps of the facility and surrounding community, identify the location of water supply and emergency notification system, and identify emergency contact information. The quick reference guide was thought up to best equip emergency personnel when information about the facility is needed with a short amount of time to make decisions. The next more stringent provision is large quantity generator closure requirements. So this does apply to your large quantity generator facilities. For hazardous waste accumulation units, this is for closing your central accumulation unit, not when closing the entire facility. There are two different options to close the hazardous waste accumulation unit. The first and probably uh, proposed to be the most popular would be putting a notice to the file specifying which accumulation area is being closed and noting that the unit will be formally closed when the facility closes in its entirety. Or a facility can choose to formally close the individual unit. This can be done by clean closure or close with waste in place. And this comes along with a notification requirement to Ohio EPA. Um, the notification must be received 90 days after closure is complete, and this will again use the EPA Form 9029. The closure of the hazardous waste accumulation units does not apply to satellite accumulation areas. Also for a large quantity generator closure requirement, there is entire facility closure. This would formally close all hazardous waste accumulation units in the facility. Again, the choice to clean close or close with waste in place, notify Ohio EPA more than 30 days prior to starting the closure and 90 days after closure is complete. This will again use Ohio EPA Form 9029. Satellite accumulation areas are not subject to this closure. There has been multiple different topics and provisions covered, so if you would like more information, feel free to call Ohio EPA Division of Environmental Response and Revitalization, also known as DER. Our phone number is 614-644-2924 and feel free to ask for our compliance assistance. This topic has also been covered at great length at the federal level, so feel free to Google generator improvements as US EPA has multiple webinars that were pre-recorded, question and answers, FAQs, and resources available to help the user community. 
Thank you for your time, and I will now turn it back over to Helen. What if the cleanup event happens before the new regulation is finalized? So as the current regulations are in effect, if a cleanup event that would change the generator category up to LQG, then the facility is considered a large quantity generator. This type of events happening frequently at the smaller generator facilities prompted this rule change in where the facility can keep their lower generator category and not fall into the large quantity generator category. So as of right now, if you're having a cleanup event in 2019, you are a large quantity generator. The biennial report and other large quantity generator regulations do apply to you. However, this provision is in the making to be an Ohio rule where you would be able to notify being a small quantity generator or very small quantity generator and not get classified and also fall into that biennial report that applies to large quantity generators. What is the process for changing a facility from an FQG to a BFQG status? To change your status, if you notice um, that you are notated as a small quantity generator and you've reevaluated your generation and notice you're now a very small quantity generator, you can notify Ohio EPA using the form mentioned. It's EPA form 9029, and that would be the paper copy. You can also do the MyRICRA ID online utility where you create an account and update all information associated with your EPA ID number. And Jackie, why don't we summarize again on you know, the process, the releasing the draft for public comment and things. I think a couple people came on late. Of course. So as this PowerPoint is based off of the federal regulations, these regulations were posted in 2016 at the federal level. Ohio EPA has been um, working towards getting the rule language drafted into Ohio rule language. This means that we are in the process of going through the rule process. We've already begun with the ESO, which is Early Stakeholder Outreach, asking for public comments about picking up these rules. That has completed and drafting has actually been performed. The rule language is being reviewed internally and um, I would anticipate in the next 30 days the draft rule language would be released into the interested party phase where we are asking for the public to provide commentary back on that draft language. If you would like to be notified as soon as this draft language is released, please uh, go to Ohio EPA's website, click sign up for updates, and um, opt in to receive notifications from the Hazardous Waste Program. Hey, do you know if Indiana has adopted these regulations? I am not specific as if Indiana has adopted these. However, if you look up US EPA, I believe uh, their webpage has a tracking mechanism to see which states have opted to pick up these regulations and if they picked up the provisions. So that would be through US EPA's Generator Improvements information page. Okay, so if a facility who is an FQG had an episodic event in April of 2019, are you saying we have to do the biennial report and would be an LQG for that month because these changes have not been implemented yet? That is correct. So as the regulations currently apply, if your facility is an SQG, you have an episodic event and that bumps your generator category up to LQG, you would need to submit the biennial report. And the biennial report would cover all waste generated at that facility during calendar year 2019. The biennial report is due March 1st of 2020. And um, if you would like to uh, go to Ohio EPA's webpage, there is under DER a page dedicated to the biennial report forms and more information located there. Okay, is submitting the biennial report the only requirement for the episodic event? If this is in reply to the previous question, as the current rules apply, if a facility becomes a large quantity generator, all large quantity generator provisions apply when the month in which you are that generator category, including the biennial report. When speaking of the episodic generator provision, 
the facilities, once this rule is in effect, if you have properly notified, would follow the requirements in that episodic generator provision, but that provision does not have facilities filling out a biennial report. So this will not be in effect in time for 2019 biennial report, but since the regulations will be effective in 2020, facilities would be able to notify and take advantage of this flexibility in reporting year of 2021. Okay, that is it for the questions. We appreciate you attending today. And again, if, if Jackie has not answered your specific question, she'll be reaching out to you via email and we'll work on getting you your answer. We did have some that were site specific. So we appreciate you taking the time today. And also, if you can complete our uh, summary evaluation that you're taking to when WebEx closes out, we would appreciate it. Otherwise, have a great day.